Good afternoon, and I don't know what's worse, the last of the day or the first one after lunch. Usually we call that one the arsenic hour. It's when even you have, the speaker has a hard time staying awake. <coughs> I'm speaking for uh, Dr. Reza today. He was unable to make it here. And it's some work that he did predominantly in Iran, and that uh, Dr. Reza is a postdoc at Worcester State University School of Food Science now. <coughs> and we've been working basically with them to expand the capabilities on this particular project and the inputs. Basically, uh, just a quick introduction, the School of Food Science <coughs> is a combined school between Washington State University and the University of Idaho. Physically, we're only seven, eight miles apart, but we realized a few years ago that Neither one of us really has sufficient funding and critical mass to be the quality we want to be, so we join forces. We do a lot of work with dairy. They're aware from down in Twin Falls to Rome, Treasure State area, all the way up to Watkins County, where you visit, some of you visited yesterday. This particular <coughs> project is involved with wheat, with Pashan wheat in Iran. Many people aren't aware that Iran is a major wheat producer, about the 12th largest in, uh, in the world in 2014. 13.5 million tons, not a real lot. But one of the problems they're doing and they're sharing with, uh, they're on the Caspian Sea. I don't know, let's see, where's the, there we go. Caspian Sea here. This is Iran and Turkmenistan. Azerbaijan, all of Central Asia, the uh, Turkmenistan, and <coughs> Azerbaijan, formerly part of the USSR. Uh, the uh, problem they're having, of course, they always have relatively <coughs> light amount of, uh, of, of precipitation there. You see, they're running about a fourth of what we have, a little quarter and fourth of what we have here in Washington State. Uh, this year, it may be a little more. But the problem they've run into is they leach in, the water in their soil has been leaching out, and they've had an overuse of fertilizers in the past, particularly under the Russian times in Azerbaijan, not so much in Iran, but the result is they have high salinity parts of Azerbaijan uh, go through the salinity so high it won't support anything. So that uh, as that increases and in the soil and in the water, as the Caspian Sea by the way is a saltwater sea, that they've been looking at ways to re develop crops or at least work to get a crop that is more salt tolerant. So in this case, what they wanted to use too was they used an underutilized fish. Um, <clears throat> for them, it's underutilized. The rest of the Caspian Sea, I think it's overutilized, quite frankly. Um, but it, it's Clukia or Cucanella, and that's similar to herring. No, same, same family. And they're doing about 12,000 metric tons per year from the Caspian Sea. They uh, fish it through a very number of methods. So one of the methods is a very deep lampara net, or just, just sort of a bag that can with, drop it down to about, uh, or about 50 fathom, turn around, it's about 300 feet, sometimes a little bit more, and then just bring it up. So drop it down in the school and bring it up. The fish are relatively small. Um, the head, good source of oil. And we use the oil, herring oil out here is used for salmon feed, trout feeds, and a lot of other feeds as a flavorant. Not necessarily for energy, but uh, as we try to get more and more vegetarian feeds for our uh, carnivorous fish, they like a little flavor, so we use that for flavor. The skin is a source of collagen. It can be used to produce uh, Sharia approved and kosher, if you will, halal and kosher collagens. Uh, viscera, 12 to 18 percent. There again, it's primarily mixed food. 
In this case, what they used was enzymatic hydrolysis. Now, we can actually do a hydrolysis with this without adding any enzymes to it. They have enough normally in the animal that they can, we can process and hydrolyze it quite easy on its own. But in this case, it's a little more sophisticated uh, project. Uh, <coughs> get on to forming the amino acid fertilizer. They wanted to, he wanted to enhance the amino acid availability and the protein availability for the breakdown to the wheat with the objective of increasing the wheat production, but also increasing the resistance to the salinity. Um, in this case, it says underlies, underutilized fish. We also use a lot of fish waste in doing hydrolysates. And hydrolysates have been around quite a long time. Uh, basically, with fish hydrolysates, it can be used either for animal feed, it can be used for uh, fertilizer, or it can be used for human food. In fact, it was used in World War II. It was one of the foods that they took under the concentration camps to get people when they came out of the prison camps. The camps they couldn't eat regular food uh, immediately. Well, they would give them the, a hydrolysis, a fish hydrolysis, which was very easy to digest. Still used today in Soviet uh, or in Russia, not the Soviet Union. They use it there for cancer patients, fit for stomach cancer patients, another one. Very easy food to eat. The uh, fish, normally we grind it up. The, you get it down almost to an homogenate. The finer the grind, the quicker it's going to work and the better your end product's going to be. In this case, it's heated to 50 degrees C and an alkalase is, uh, enzyme is added to it. The alkalase is from Bacillus uh, it was Stalena, <laughs> I believe it was under Stalena, and uh, has several trade names. In this particular case, there's uh, a company from uh, Baku, actually is one that produces the enzyme, but several other countries, Novzyme, Kerosene produces the enzyme. Quite common. The uh, hydrolysate is usually just to mix it with the additive. Uh, if we're not using the enzyme, we would use about one and a half to two percent formic acid if we're developing a fish feed or animal feed, and we would use phosphoric acid if we're going after fertilizer. The same with formic acid would be for human feed also. You can use hydrochloric or sulfuric acid, but you end up with some salts you're really not wanting. Once you've got a break or the you've reached the break down on the proteins where you want it, you change with the length that you desire, then you stop the enzyme reaction in this case by heating up to about 90 degrees, 90 degrees C. You can also break off the oil, by the way, at that point, run it through a centrifuge or a decanter and break out the oil if you're after the oil separate. But uh, the liquid and solid phases are added to break them down. If we're going after the oil, sometimes use it uh, three-phase decanter, pull the oil off, or we may take the stick water, run it through a polisher, you know, another centrifuge, basically. Amino Hercon is the name of the fertilizer. It's been commercialized. Uh, the Hercan group is based in Baku, Azerbaijan. It's not in uh, Iran, but operates in Iran. The uh, growth that they're looking at there was they're trying to develop uh, physical growth, chlorophyll, and reduce some residual salinity. So greenhouse conditions, temperature 26 degrees Celsius, that's about average in the wheat part, wheat part of the country, that's about an average temperature. So that's 26, that's about 80 degrees. 70, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Relative humidity, 40%. Photo period, 16 to 8 light days. Results, basically they got increased. The, here they compared it with four fertilizers, commercial fertilizers. The first three is F1 through F3 or Spanish origin. Uh, sorry we don't have a breakdown on what the 
and PK is on those, but it's probably pretty standard, probably 5, 10, 5 or something like that. Uh, fish fertilizers tend to be lower in, uh, lower in nitrogen, and phosphorus, some of them are almost zero phosphorus, that's one reason for fertilizer we use phosphoric acid. But they're very low in phosphorus as a rule. But, so we have the fourth fertilizer was of UK origin. Anything to see in here was that it did get an increase pretty well and came out fine. The, uh, again, the values we have here, values are significantly different. This is the greenhouse. They used, they raised it for a relatively short period of time. It wasn't headed out and they didn't analyze the grain. Well, to me and for us from this part of the country, we would have carried it clean on through and see what the actual, what are we getting there in the final product. And that's what we will be doing now. Follow through at WSU. We got a little bit of weed around WSU in Idaho, so it's very to work with. That's some of the highest production per acre dry land wheat country in the world. And uh, also we're going to be using it with chickpeas and probably lentils and peas. There again, the seedling height came out quite well. It was higher and the seedling weight was stronger. The amino acid composition, uh, breakdown on it, you can see it's a little bit stronger almost all the way through than the commercial fertilizers. I'm going pretty quick here because I know you'd like to get out of here for the night. Commercialization, what we've done there is they did the lab scale, they did the greenhouse test. Now we're going to go, they're going to the farm test and, and uh, Azerbaijan and we're going to go with the farm test here. Country. Just some other related products from fish waste. Um, several products are, are made from it. I haven't tried that allergy soda. It, it doesn't look real, <laughs> real good to me, but uh, maybe my vegan daughter-in-law might try it there. Fish feed, though, the, the center, that's pretty well, some larger pellets or that's sturgeon pellets. But yeah, that's probably very, very good use for this product. Uh, some continuing efforts, continuing programs. First, optimization of the amino acid, fertilizer composition, and based on the application of specific crops. As I said, I think we're gonna expand the crops into the uh, growing crop in, Eastern Western right now, the very profitable one is chickpeas, or garbanzos. Uh, we have uh, 10 farmers that I work with quite a bit and I'm working on some grain with them. They formed a little group on raising chickpeas and last year they split $500 million in revenues on chickpeas. So that's pretty darn good farming. Uh, we want to see all the effects of the seafood-based amino acid fertilizer on the nutritional value, as well as disease resistance of plants. Ironically, the fish fertilizers are unique to hydrolysates. In some cases, we spray them on the crop, and on certain leafy crops, they have an anti, uh, they're a pesticide. So nutritional pesticides, so resistance to insects. Uh, the other, so, uh, you know, other particular products that we've got that we can work with, tuna waste in that area is quite, there's just a, a number of different critters with, uh, with waste. Um, restaurant waste has been used. The slaughterhouse byproducts, combinations of it. And this is just some more recent pictures I took. I came back from Sri Lanka about two weeks ago working over there on developing fish feeds. That's my raw material, the input. Those are yellowfin tuna gills. That's a really interesting to work with. They're extremely hard to grind up and break down. These are flying fish heads. 
Well, that's got a lot of bone, a lot of ash there because of the flying fish. When you get the head, oops, when you get the head there, you also get the wings of the fins that are at the flying. It's just a simple fish compost we're making out of that material now in Sri Lanka. We've been doing some fish feed and out of it. It's been quite successful so far. Well, anyway, that was pretty quick. Are there any questions or anything I can answer for you? Yes, ma'am. So, it seems that this would be a fairly expensive product compared to just manure or commercial fertilizer. Have they, I mean, it seems like you should be testing it on tomatoes or roses or, this you know, something high value. Actually, it's a very inexpensive fertilizer to make. Uh, from the fertilizer stand and the feed stand, you make it here. Uh, I mean, 